Aloha. You have heard me talk about working part-time so I can live full-time. You've read my books about it, and today I'm going to show you. I'm inviting you into my home so you can see how I live, where I live, do laundry, all of that, and explain the mental transition of stepping away from the societal definition of success and normal and expectations and creating your own path. A big game changer for me is when I found out that if you buy an RV to serve as your primary residence, it is considered a mortgage, not a car loan. So we're talking about a 20-year mortgage for $50,000, which is only about 200 bucks a month if your credit's good. And that's significantly more affordable for rent than anything else, especially in Southern California. So being rich is not about making more, it's about reducing our expenses. And when deciding which RV to get, it's all about the floor plan. Figure out what's really important to you. Most of them are designed to sleep as many people as possible. But that wasn't important to me. For me, what's most important is kitchen space and food prep area because I prepare most of my own meals. This RV came with a couch on the left that I had removed and replaced it with a countertop and drawers uh, just from Ikea. And as you can see, this is a really nice interior, nicer than anything else I could afford for $200 a month. I've got a fully functional kitchen. Uh, I got uh, three burners. I got a, uh, an oven and a, a stove, a sink. This is, this is fantastic. It's beautiful. It's enough. And I'm going to talk about that a lot, how redefining what enough looks like means we have plenty. On the right side, there was a little table, and I had dropped it down to serve as a little lounge area. And there's plenty of storage space, which is actually really great. I'm about to give you a little sneak peek of where I keep the books. Um, all the proceeds from the books support the Prison Library Project. So when you order a Faithfully Religionless or Buddhist Boot Camp, another copy is donated to correctional facilities all across the country. I receive many thank you letters from them that are, ought to be addressed to you. You guys are supporting a really great cause, and I appreciate it. They appreciate it very much. This RV came with a really large bed area there, the bunk bed, which I've never used. Um, what was important to me, as I said, is the kitchen food prep area and this is nice this is nicer than anything else i've got drawers which are just as if not nicer than what i would find in a conventional home i'm going to talk to you later about what i did with the plumbing and where i park it and all of the nuts and bolts of transitioning to a tiny home but this this doesn't feel tiny to me it feels uh, abundant because i've got everything i need uh, i'm about to do something really personal. I'm inviting you into my bedroom. I have been honest and transparent with you for years, so this is perhaps the next inevitable step. Uh, this is my bedroom. I don't really use that bunk bed in the back. Uh, I don't have any artwork in my home, but I want to send a shout out to Anne LeClaire, who sent me this. It's uh, She's a really big fan of uh, Buddhist Boot Camp, and this is a scene from Fight Club. It is only after we have lost everything that we are free to do anything. That's the true definition of liberation. If you lose the idea that you need more space, bigger, better, faster, more, you are actually liberated to do anything. Back here, I have a TV for some TED Talks, YouTube, uh, Netflix, what have you. Uh, this is Ian. He is very well trained to stay quiet. And it's a very cozy, wonderful little home. I have over here is my closet. This place actually came with a larger closet I'm going to show you in a minute. But this is all I have. I have five gray t-shirts and one pair of jeans. So this is the only closet I needed. I converted the other one to, to more pantry space. <laughs> I'm going to show you. Um, over here, I've got a full-size fridge. Well, it's not full-size, but it's plenty. Again, it's, it's large enough. It's got everything I need. And I feel truly blessed and fortunate that I can donate all the proceeds from books to the Prison Library Project, all the proceeds from t-shirts to Mercy for Animals, to the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, because all I need is this. Anything from Patreon goes to pay for things like the podcast hosting and all of that. This is... I... I I live a very simple life, so and we, we all can. We, can. we all want a simple life, and yet we complicate it to no end. So this is my invitation for all of us to kind of rethink what we think we need and realize that less is more. Over here is a bathroom, everything you would expect. I'm going to again talk later about what I did with the plumbing. I got rid of the black water tank, so there's nothing there to worry about. Um, vanity, sink, uh, shower. This literally has everything I need, and it's really nice, 
and um, small, you know, and that's the beauty. Cleaning it is 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 really easy. Uh, if I don't own it, I don't have to dust it. So less is really more. I, it's it's about redefining what's really important to us, and our actions convey our priorities. So over here is where the closet was intended to be. <laughs> this is where I keep my drinking water because I don't have any more clothes, and so I turned it into a pantry and I keep more food in there. Uh, there are a couple of drawers underneath. Uh, it's where I keep like socks, underwear, uh, board shorts, and whatnot. This is my washing machine. It is a portable washing machine called Base Camp. It's designed for campers, and you plug it in. What I do is put it in the shower, fill it up with water, detergent. It fits a handful of shirts, some socks, underwear. It looks like I've got a fleece sweater there and a hand towel. And if I ever have larger stuff than that or more like bedding and towels and whatnot, I'll take it to a local laundromat. But for the most part, this does the trick. All the water is then drained to a gray water tank that's attached and below the RV. Most RVs, if you don't know, come with two tanks underneath. One is a gray water tank for all the waste uh, soapy water from the kitchen sink and from the shower. And the other one is a black water tank that is hooked up to the toilet. What I had done is I eliminated the black water tank and I replaced my toilet with a dry flush toilet that's completely waterless. I'm going to show you how that works in a minute. But uh, the gray water is, uh, goes to the gray water tank. I get an indicator light when the gray water tank is full and then I empty it out. I'm going to walk you through how I empty it out. But I wanted to show you the washing machine and how that works. Again, it goes through the uh, wash cycle and then you drain out the water, the soapy water, and fill it up with just water for the rinse cycle. And then you put everything in the little basket and it goes through the spin cycle to get all the water out of it. And then you hang it to dry, um, which is what I do. I've got a little clothesline in the back of the RV. So here I am emptying out the soapy water and that again drains into the gray water tank. And when that's full, then I empty that out. I'm not going to go through the rinse cycle again. I'm just going to skip that part in the video and show you what happens after the rinse cycle. I take the clothes out. I put in the little basket where um, all the clothes are going to go for the spin cycle. Now, the basket's a little smaller than the wash itself, so sometimes not all the clothes fit, but that's okay. Then I'll just split it in two. But in this case, everything actually does fit into the uh, spin cycle basket. So stuff that all in there. And then you set the timer for, I believe it's only three minutes uh, for the spin cycle. And the, all the water is just pushed out of it. And then I hang it to dry. It's a, it's a small price to pay to do this for uh, being able to live minimally. And uh, it's pretty fantastic. So you just put it on spin, set the timer for three minutes, hold it down because <laughs> it does go a little crazy. I'm going to open the lid and show you. This is the spin cycle, and then you take the clothes out and hang them to dry. I've got a little clothesline in the back of the RV. Now I'm going to show you the toilet. <laughs> and I went ahead and I sacrificed a banana <laughs> for, the, for the sake of showing you how it works. It works very much like a diaper genie uh, where it's completely waterless. You push a button, and it ties everything into a knot, and it pushes it down to the bottom. And you get a little indicator when there's no uh, filler left. And then you take it all out and you throw it away like a dirty diaper. But I've completely eliminated the need for a black water tank or to ever need to deal with the waste of uh, black water and sewage and all of that. When I do need to empty out the gray water, this is how I do it. But as far as the toilet goes, I've made my life really easy and stress-free by eliminating the black water tank altogether. I'm really glad I did. It was it was quite fantastic. It doesn't handle uh, liquid very well. Um, I'm a guy, so it's really easy. I can just use bottles for that. But I also heard from someone else that um, you can use it for liquid and then you just put in some uh, kitty litter that turns into solid, then you push the button and it works the same way. For emptying out the gray water tank, which is what I'm doing here, uh, you plug in this portable tank that I have. And if you're parked in an RV park, that hose will just be uh, you know, uh, it going into the ground and that's how you get rid of all your waste. But because I don't live in an RV park, I'm just parked in front of a friend's house. I fill up this portable tank. I plug it into the RV. I do this once a week, maybe once every two weeks. Again, there's an indicator light on the inside that tells me, hey, your gray water tank is getting full. 
And when it is, again, we're only dealing with soapy water from the shower and from the kitchen sink from washing dishes or doing laundry. So I have zero issue with handling uh, gray water. So I just plug that in and empty out the gray water tank into this portable tank. And when that's done, uh, this is in real time. So you'll get to see what, I believe it's a 28 gallon uh, tank. So this is it, it's done. It just finished draining it. And then I'm going to walk it over and dump it. So I'm parked in front of a friend's house and uh, I was parked in front of another family's house before I was here. And someone has said to me, oh my gosh, she's so nice to let you park in front of her house. But I'm, I don't get me wrong, she is extremely nice. But why wouldn't anyone, if somebody knocked on your door and said, hey, can I park my RV in front of your house? And, you know, in exchange, maybe I'll pay your electric bill every month because I am plugged into the electric outlet and, and the water um, hose. Why wouldn't anyone just say, yes, absolutely, you can park in front of my house? There's a program called Couch Surfing, uh, which is designed to let people sleep on people's couches while they're traveling. But now there is a driveway surfing where people list their driveways for um, possible RVers who need a place to park their RV. Most people don't know in front of almost every house, there is actually an access point to the sewage. And this is what I'm doing here is I empty out the portable tank into the access point in front of the house. So I just take out the water that just filled it and empty it out. And again, this is just gray water. So it's just soapy water. Can you do this with the black water tank? Absolutely. Um, I, I just didn't want to deal with <laughs> waste from the toilet, possibly leaking or any, none of that. I just eliminated that entire issue by um, using the dry flush toilet. And that's it. I just plug that in like that and takes care of the again I do this once a week maybe once every two weeks and that's it, it just really depends on how much water I use the RV is parked in front of the house um, it's a fairly small um, it's a 25 footer and the only reason I didn't go with a 22 footer is because I needed that kitchen space and now I'm going to explain to you why I live this way I didn't get the RV with the intention to travel with it and drive it around, or I would have gotten something significantly more gas efficient. This is literally an apartment substitute because most people's biggest monthly expense is their rent or mortgage payment. By eliminating that huge expense, I've made it possible to work part-time so I can spend my life living instead of working. I have time to read, to volunteer, hike, kayak, prepare food at home so I know all the ingredients in my meals as part of my health assurance plan. I'm never in a hurry and this life has deepened my relationships with people and it has led to a better overall health, uh, physical, mental, spiritual, and emotional. It's amazing how that one decision to simplify my life has also enriched it in every way. My daily routine now resembles what I used to wait all year to do while on a two-week vacation or what most people put off until retirement. And I've written books and given talks about living at peace with the world, but the message would lose all validity if I didn't actually walk the talk. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine me showing up at a Buddhist boot camp discussion in a limo? <laughs> it wouldn't be congruent. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong inherently or otherwise with making money or working hard if you love doing what you do. The invitation is for us to take ownership of how busy we are instead of playing the victim role, blaming other people for what is our responsibility to nourish. We live in a culture addicted to more. And for a very simple reason, we haven't defined what enough looks like. And if you haven't defined what enough is, then you'll never have it. I don't know if that makes sense. You know, I've been making less than $10,000 a year for more than a decade. And I feel like the richest person in the world. And it's not because I earn so much. It's because I need so little. It's because I've redefined what success looks like. And I've redefined success as being happy. Prior to that, I was working 50 to 60 hours a week in the corporate world, living in a condo downtown with a sports car, the designer furniture, the designer clothes. <laughs> I appeared very successful by society's normal definition of what success looks like, but I was very much in debt. So my first step was to pay off my debt, and I remember that day. 
I was writing the check like I was writing every month to Citibank to pay off that credit card debt. And I realized I'm not going to need to send them that money next month. What am I going to do with all that money? And luckily, instead of thinking about what I'm going to spend it on, I thought, well, if I don't have to send them that money, then I don't have to make that money. What if I work less and live more? <laughs> and that kind of became a game of how much less, like how little can I work? which is very different from what society tells you, which is work more, make more, buy more. <laughs> and I decided to flip that around because that same week when I was paying off my debt, another paralegal at the office was celebrating her 30 year anniversary with the firm. <laughs> and the fact that she was celebrating 30 years in a cubicle terrified me even more than that income to debt ratio. So I didn't know, I'm, I'm gonna be really honest with you, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life, but right there and then, I knew what I didn't want. It's like I saw into the future and I saw that's going to be me if I don't get out. And I think knowing what we don't want is an equally helpful navigation tool to get through life. It's the process of elimination. One of the first things that needed to shift for me was my language around my life. We need to stop saying things like, I have to. Because every time you say or even think, I have to, you're saying, poor me, I'm a victim, I have no choice. And victim mentality is fear-based. It's very restricting. It's not very empowering. You feel enslaved by a system that quite often you're in a prison cell that you yourself have constructed. So I stopped saying I have to and I changed it to I choose to. And that sparked a whole new way of looking at the choices that I make and the price that comes with making those choices. Because let's face it, there are no wrong choices here. I'm not saying there's a right or wrong way to do things, only that we all make our own choices and we all pay our own prices. If you choose to live in a big house and drive a big car with your brand new cell phone and your clothes, that's fine. But be honest with yourself that you're also choosing to get up early five days a week at least to work full time if not overtime and to sacrifice some of the things that you believe are more important but your actions convey otherwise so all I essentially did was take responsibility for my choices which liberated me to make different decisions that were actually more in line with my core values but just like I said earlier about how we will never have enough if we haven't defined what enough is, we also can't live in line with our core values if we haven't defined them for ourselves. You know, Gandhi said that happiness is when what you think, what you say, and what you do are all in harmony. And I not only believe it to be true, I live it every day. So I hope that we can all close the gap between what we believe and how we act in the world. Namaste. Timber Hawkeye is the best-selling author of Faithfully Religionless and Buddhist Boot Camp. For additional information, please visit BuddhistBootCamp.com, where you can order autographed books to support the Prison Library Project, watch Timber's inspiring TED Talk, and join our monthly mailing list. We hope you have enjoyed this episode and invite you to subscribe for more thought-provoking discussions. Thank you for being a soldier of peace in the Army of Love.